Section 35 of After Dark. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Warren Cotty, Gurney, Illinois. After Dark by Wilkie Collins. Prologue to the Sixth Story. On the last occasion when I made a lengthened stay in London, my wife and I were surprised and amused one morning by the receipt of the following note, addressed to me in a small, crabbed, foreign-looking handwriting. Professor Tizzy presents amiable compliments to Mr. Kirby, the artist, and is desirous of having his portrait done, to be engraved from and placed at the beginning of the voluminous work on, quote, the vital principle, or invisible essence of life, end quote which the professor is now preparing for the press and posterity the professor will give five pounds and will look upon his face with satisfaction as an object perpetuated for public contemplation at a reasonable rate if mr kirby will accept the sum just mentioned in regard to the professor's ability to pay five pounds as well as to offer them if mr kirby should from ignorance entertain injurious doubts he is requested to apply to the professor's honorable friend, Mr. Lanfray, of Rockley Place. But for the reference at the end of this strange note, I should certainly have considered it as a mere trap set to make a fool of me by some mischievous friend. As it was, I rather doubted the propriety of taking any serious notice of Professor Tizzy's offer, and I might probably have ended by putting the letter in the fire without further thought about it. But for the arrival by the next post, of a note from Mr. Lanfray, which solved all my doubts, and sent me away at once to make the acquaintance of the learned discoverer of the essence of life. Do not be surprised, Mr. Lanfray wrote, if you get a strange note from a very eccentric Italian, one Professor Tizzi, formerly of the University of Padua. I have known him for some years. Scientific inquiry is his monomania, and vanity his ruling passion. He has written a book on the principle of life, which nobody but himself will ever read, but which he is determined to publish, with his own portrait for frontispiece. If it is worth your while to accept the little he can offer you, take it by all means, for he is a character worth knowing. He was exiled, I should tell you, years ago, for some absurd political reason, and has lived in England ever since. All the money he inherits from his father who is a mail contractor in the north of Italy, goes in books and experiments. But I think I can answer for his solvency, at any rate, for the large sum of five pounds. If you are not very much occupied just now, go and see him. He is sure to amuse you. Professor Tizzy lived in the northern suburb of London. On approaching his house, I found it, so far as outward appearance went, excessively dirty and neglected but in no other respect different from the other villas in the neighborhood. The front garden door, after I had rang twice, was opened by a yellow-faced, suspicious old foreigner, dressed in worn-out clothes, and completely and consistently dirty all over, from top to toe. On mentioning my name and business, this old man led me across a weedy, neglected garden, and admitted me into the house. At the first step into the passage, I was surrounded by books closely packed in plain wooden shelves they ran all along the wall on either side to the back of the house and when i looked up at the carpetless staircase i saw nothing but books again running all the way up the wall as far as my eye could reach here is the artist painter cried the old servant throwing open one of the parlor doors before i had half done looking at the books and signing impatiently to me to walk into the room books again all around the walls and all over the floor among them a plain deal table with leaves of manuscript piled high on every part of it among the leaves a head of long elfish white hair covered with a black skull cap and bent down over a book above the head a sallow withered hand shaking itself at me as a sign that i must not venture to speak just at that moment on the tops of the bookcases glass vases full of spirits of some kind with horrible objects floating in the liquid dirt on the window panes cobwebs hanging from the ceiling dust springing up in clouds under my intruding feet these were the things i observed on first entering the study of professor tizzy 
after i had waited for a minute or so the shaking hand stopped descended with a smack on the nearest pile of manuscript seized the book that the head had been bending over and flung it contemptuously to the other end of the room i've refuted you at any rate said professor tizzy looking with extreme complacency at the cloud of dust raised by the fall of the rejected volume he turned next to me what a grand face it was what a broad white forehead what fiercely brilliant black eyes what perfect regularity and refinement in the other features with the long venerable hair framing them in as it were on either side poor as i was i felt that i could have painted his portrait for nothing titian van dyke velasquez any of the three would have paid him to sit to them accept my humblest excuses sir said the old man speaking english with a singularly pure accent for a foreigner that absurd book plunged me so deep down in the quagmires of sophistry and error mr kirby that i really could not get to the surface at once when you came into the room so you are willing to draw my likeness for such a small sum as five pounds he continued rising and showing me that he wore a long black velvet gown instead of the paltry and senseless costume of modern times i informed him that five pounds was as much as i generally got for a drawing it seems little said the professor but if you want fame i can make it up to you in that way there is my great work he pointed to the piles of manuscript the portrait of my mind and the mirror of my learning put a likeness of my face on the first page and posterity will then be thoroughly acquainted with me outside and in your portrait will be engraved mr kirby and your name shall be inscribed under the print you shall be associated sir in that way with a work which will form an epoch in the history of human science the vital principle or in other words the essence of that mysterious something which we call life and which extends down from man to the feeblest insect and the smallest plant has been an unguessed riddle from the beginning of the world to the present time i alone have found the answer and here it is he fixed his dazzling eyes on me in triumph and smacked the piles of manuscript fiercely with both his sallow hands i saw that he was waiting for me to say something so i asked if his great work had not cost a vast expenditure of time and pains i am seventy sir said the professor and i began preparing myself for that book at twenty after mature consideration i have written it in english having three other foreign languages at my fingers ends as a substantial proof of my gratitude to the nation that has given me an asylum perhaps you think the work looks rather long in its manuscript state it will occupy twelve volumes sir and it is not half long enough even then for the subject i take two volumes and no man could do it in less to examine the theories of all the philosophers in the world ancient and modern on the vital principle i take two more and little enough to scatter every one of the theories seriatim to the winds i take two more at the risk for brevity's sake of doing things by halves to explain the exact stuff or vital compound of which the first man and woman in the world were made calling them adam and eve out of deference to popular prejudices i take two more but you are standing all this time mr kirby and i am talking instead of sitting for my portrait pray take any books you want anywhere off the floor and make a seat of any height you please furniture would only be in my way here so i don't trouble myself with anything of the kind i obediently followed the professor's directions and had just heaped up a pile of grimy quartos when the old servant entered the room with a shabby little tray in his hand in the middle of the tray i saw a crust of bread and a bit of garlic encircled by a glass of water a knife salt pepper a bottle of vinegar and a flask of oil with your permission i'm going to breakfast said professor tizzy as the tray was set down before him on the part of his great work relating to the vital compound of adam and eve as he spoke he took up the piece of bread and rubbed the crusty part of it with the bit of garlic till it looked as polished as a new dining table that done he turned the bread crumb uppermost and saturated it with oil adding a few drops of vinegar sprinkled with pepper and salt and with a gleam of something very like greediness in his bright eyes took up the knife to cut himself a first mouthful of the horrible mess that he had just concocted the best of breakfasts said the professor seeing me look amazed not a cannibal meal of chicken life in embryo vulgarly called an egg 
not a dog's gorge of a dead animal's flesh blood and bones warmed with fire popularly known as a chop not a breakfast sir that lions tigers caribbees and costermongers could all partake of alike but an innocent nutritive simple vegetable meal a philosopher's refection a breakfast that a prize-fighter would turn from in disgust and that a plato would share with relish i have no doubt that he was right and that i was prejudiced but as i saw the first oily vinegary garlicky morsel slide noiselessly into his mouth i began to feel rather sick my hands were dirty with moving the books and i asked if i could wash them before beginning to work at the likeness as a good excuse for getting out of the room while professor tizzy was unctuously disposing of his simple vegetable meal the philosopher looked a little astonished at my request as if the washing of hands at irregular times and seasons offered a comparatively new subject of contemplation to him but he rang a handbell on his table immediately and told the old servant to take me up into his bedroom the interior of the parlor had astonished me but a sight of the bedroom was a new sensation not of the most agreeable kind the couch on which the philosopher sought repose after his labors was a truckle bed that would not have fetched half a crown at sale on one side of it dangled from the ceiling a complete male skeleton looking like all that was left of a man who might have hung himself about a century ago and who had never been disturbed since the moment of his suicide on the other side of the bed stood a long press in which i observed hideous colored preparations of the muscular system and bottles with curious twining thread-like substances inside them which might have been remarkable worms or dissections of nerves scattered amicably side by side with the professor's hairbrush three parts worn out with remnants of his beard on bits of shaving paper with a broken shoe horn and with a travelling looking-glass of the sort usually sold at sixpence apiece repetitions of the litter of books in the parlor lay all about over the floor colored anatomical prints were nailed anyhow against the walls rolled-up towels were scattered here there and everywhere in the wildest confusion as if the room had been bombarded with them and last but by no means least remarkable among the other extraordinary objects in the bedchamber the stuffed figure of a large unshaven poodle dog stood on an old card table keeping perpetual watch over a pair of the philosopher's black breeches twisted round his forepaws i had started on entering the room at the skeleton and i started once more at the dog the old servant noticed me each time with a sardonic grin don't be afraid he said one is as dead as the other with these words he left me to wash my hands finding little more than a pint of water at my disposal and failing altogether to discover where the soap was kept i was not long in performing my ablutions before leaving the room i looked again at the stuffed poodle on the board to which he was fixed i saw painted in faded letters the word scaramuccia evidently the comic italian name to which he had answered in his lifetime there was no other inscription but i made up my mind that the dog must have been the professor's pet and that he kept the animal stuffed in his bedroom as a remembrance of past times who would have suspected so great a philosopher of having so much heart thought i leaving the bedroom to go downstairs again the professor had done his breakfast and was anxious to begin the sitting so i took out my chalks and paper and set to work at once i seated on one pile of books and he on another fine anatomical preparations in my room are there not mr kirby said the old gentleman did you notice a very interesting and perfect arrangement of the intestinal ganglia they formed the subject of an important chapter in my great work i am afraid you will think me very ignorant i replied but i really do not know the intestinal ganglia when i see them the object i noticed with most curiosity in your room was something more on a level with my own small capacity and what was that asked the professor the figure of the stuffed poodle i suppose he was a favorite of yours of mine no no a young woman's favorite sir before i was born and a very remarkable dog too the vital principle in that poodle mr kirby must have been singularly intensified he lived to a fabulous old age and he was clever enough to play an important part of his own in what you english call 
a romance of real life if i could only have dissected that poodle i would have put him into my book he should have headed my chapter on the vital principle of beasts here is a story in prospect thought i if i can only keep his attention up to the subject he should have figured in my great work sir the professor went on scaramuccia should have taken his place among the examples that prove my new theory but unfortunately he died before i was born his mistress gave him stuffed as you see upstairs to my father to take care of for her and he has descended as an heirloom to me talking of dogs mr kirby i have ascertained beyond the possibility of doubt that the brachial plexus in people who die of hydrophobia oh, but stop i had better show you how it is the preparation is upstairs under my wash hand stand he left his seat as he spoke in another minute he would have sent the servant to fetch the preparation and i should have lost the story at the risk of his taking offence i begged him not to move just then unless he wished me to spoil his likeness this alarmed but fortunately did not irritate him he returned to his seat and i resumed the subject of the stuffed poodle asking him boldly to tell me the story with which the dog was connected the demand seemed to impress him with no very favourable opinion of my intellectual tastes but he complied with it and related not without many a wearisome digression to the subject of his great work the narrative which i propose calling by the name of the yellow mask after the slight specimens that i have given of his character and style of conversation it will be almost unnecessary for me to premise that i tell this story as i have told the last and sister rose in my own language and according to my own plan and the disposition of the incidents adding nothing of course to the facts but keeping them within the limits which my disposable space prescribes to me i may perhaps be allowed to add in this place that i have not yet seen or heard of my portrait in an engraved state professor tizzy is still alive but i look in vain through the publisher's lists for an announcement of his learned work on the vital principle possibly he may be adding a volume or two to the twelve already completed by way of increasing the debt which a deeply obliged posterity is sooner or later sure of owing to him end of section thirty five recording by warren cotty gurney illinois section thirty six of after dark this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. After Dark by Wilkie Collins. The Professor's Story of the Yellow Mask. Part First, Chapter One. About a century ago, there lived in the ancient city of Pisa a famous Italian milliner who, by way of indicating to all customers her familiarity with Paris fashions, adopted a French title, and called herself the Demoiselle Griffoni. She was a wizen little woman, with a mischievous face, a quick tongue, a nimble foot, a talent for business, and an uncertain disposition. Rumour hinted that she was immensely rich, and scandal suggested that she would do anything for money. The one undeniable good quality which raised Demoiselle Griffoni above all her rivals in the trade was her inexhaustible fortitude. She was never known to yield an inch under any pressure of adverse circumstances. Thus, the memorable occasion of her life on which she was threatened with ruin was also the occasion on which she most triumphantly asserted the energy and decision of her character. At the height of the demoiselle's prosperity, her skilled forewoman and cutter out basely married and started in business as her rival. Such a calamity as this would have ruined an ordinary milliner, but the invincible Griffoni rose superior to it almost without an effort, and proved incontestably that it was impossible for hostile fortune to catch her at the end of her resources. While the minor milliners were prophesying that she would shut up shop, she was quietly carrying on a private correspondence with an agent in Paris. 
nobody knew what these letters were about until a few weeks had elapsed and then circulars were received by all the ladies in pisa announcing that the best french forewoman who could be got for money was engaged to superintend the great griffoni establishment this master stroke decided the victory all the demoiselles customers declined giving orders elsewhere until the forewoman from paris had exhibited to the natives of pisa the latest fashions from the metropolis of the world of dress the frenchwoman arrived punctual to the appointed day glib and curt smiling and flippant tight of face and supple of figure her name was mademoiselle virginet and her family had inhumanely deserted her she was set to work the moment she was inside the doors of the griffoni establishment a room was devoted to her own private use magnificent materials in velvet silk and satin with due accompaniment of muslins lace and ribbons were placed at her disposal she was told to spare no expense and to produce in the shortest possible time the finest and nearest specimen dresses for exhibition in the showroom mademoiselle virginie undertook to do everything required of her produced her portfolios of patterns and her book of colored designs and asked for one assistant who could speak french enough to interpret her orders to the italian girls in the workroom i have the very person you want cried demoiselle griffoni a workwoman we call brigida here the idlest slut in pisa but as sharp as a needle has been in france and speaks the language like a native i'll send her to you directly mademoiselle virginie was not left long alone with her patterns and silk a tall woman with bold black eyes a reckless manner and a step as firm as a man's stalked into the room with the gait of a tragedy queen crossing the stage the instant her eyes fell on the french forewoman she stopped threw up her hands in astonishment and exclaimed finette teresa cried the french woman casting her scissors on the table and advancing a few steps hush call me brigida hush call me virginie these two exclamations were uttered at the same moment and then the two women scrutinized each other in silence the swarthy cheeks of the italian turned to a dull yellow and the voice of the french woman trembled a little when she spoke again how in the name of heaven have you dropped down in the world as low as this she asked i thought you were provided for when silence interrupted brigida you see i was not provided for i have had my misfortunes and you are the last woman alive who ought to refer to them do you think i have not had my misfortunes too since we met brigida's face brightened maliciously at those words you have had your revenge continued mademoiselle virginie coldly turning away to the table and taking up the scissors again brigida followed her threw one arm roughly round her neck and kissed her on the cheek let us be friends again she said the frenchwoman laughed tell me how i have had my revenge pursued the other tightening her grasp mademoiselle virginie signed to brigida to stoop and whispered rapidly in her ear the italian listened eagerly with fierce suspicious eyes fixed on the door when the whispering ceased she loosened her hold and with a sigh of relief pushed back her heavy black hair from her temples now we are friends she said and sat down indolently in a chair placed by the work table friends repeated mademoiselle virginie with another laugh and now for business she continued getting a row of pins ready for use by putting them between her teeth i am here i believe for the purpose of ruining the late forewoman who has set up in opposition to us 
Good. I will ruin her. Spread out the yellow brocaded silk, my dear, and pin that pattern on at your end, while I pin at mine. And what are your plans, Brigida? Mind, you don't forget that Finette is dead, and that Virginie has risen from her ashes. You can't possibly intend to stop here all your life. Leave an inch outside the paper all round. You must have projects. What are they? Look at my figure, said Brigida, placing herself in an attitude in the middle of the room. Ah, rejoined the other, it is not what it was. There is too much of it. You want diet, walking, and a French stay-maker, muttered Mademoiselle Virginie through her chevaux de frise of pins. Did the goddess Minerva walk and employ a French stay-maker? I thought she rode upon clouds and lived at a period before waists were invented. What do you mean? This, that my present project is to try if I can't make my fortune by sitting as a model for Minerva in the studio of the best sculptor in Pisa. And who is he? Unwind me a yard or two of that black lace. The master sculptor, Luca Lomi, an old family, once noble, but down in the world now. The master is obliged to make statues to get a living for his daughter and himself. More of the lace, double it over the bosom of the dress. And how is sitting to this needy sculptor to make your fortune? Wait a minute. There are other sculptors besides him in the studio. There is, first, his brother, the priest, Father Rocco, who passes all his spare time with the master. He is a good sculptor in his way, has cast statues and made a font for his church, a holy man who devotes all his work in the studio to the cause of piety. Ah, bah! We should think him a droll priest in France. More pins. You don't expect him to put money in your pocket, surely? Wait, I say again. There is a third sculptor in the studio. Actually, a nobleman. His name is Fabio Dascoli. He is rich, young, handsome, an only child, and little better than a fool. Fancy his working at sculpture, as if he had his bread to get by it, and thinking that an amusement. Imagine a man belonging to one of the best families in Pisa, mad enough to want to make a reputation as an artist. Wait, wait, the best is to come. His father and mother are dead. He has no near relations in the world to exercise authority over him. He is a bachelor, and his fortune is all at his own disposal. Going a-begging, my friend, absolutely going a-begging for want of a clever woman to hold out her hand and take it from him. Yes, yes, now I understand. The goddess Minerva is a clever woman, and she will hold out her hand and take his fortune from him with the utmost docility. The first thing is to get him to offer it. I must tell you that I am not going to sit to him, but to his master, Luca Lomi, who is doing the statue of Minerva. The face is modelled from his daughter, and now he wants somebody to sit for the bust and arms. Madeleine Lomi and I are as nearly as possible the same height, I hear, the difference between us being that I have a good figure and she has a bad one. I have offered to sit through a friend who is employed in the studio. If the master accepts, I am sure of an introduction to our rich young gentleman and then leave it to my good looks, my various accomplishments, and my ready tongue to do the rest. Stop! I won't have the lace doubled on second thoughts. I'll have it single, and running all round the dress in curves, so. Well, and who is this friend of yours employed in the studio? A fourth sculptor? No, no, the strangest, simplest little creature. Just then... A faint tap was audible at the door of the room. Brigida laid her finger on her lips 
and called impatiently to the person outside to come in. The door opened gently, and a young girl, poorly but very neatly dressed, entered the room. She was rather thin and under the average height, but her head and figure were in perfect proportion. Her hair was of that gorgeous auburn colour, her eyes of that deep violet blue, which the portraits of Giorgione and Titian have made famous as the type of Venetian beauty. Her features possessed the definiteness and regularity, the good modelling, to use an artist's term, which is the rarest of all womanly charms, in Italy as elsewhere. The one serious defect of her face was its paleness. Her cheeks, wanting nothing in form, wanted everything in colour. That look of health, which is the essential crowning point of beauty, was the one attraction which her face did not possess. She came into the room with a sad and weary expression in her eyes, which changed, however, the moment she observed the magnificently dressed French forewoman into a look of astonishment and almost of awe. Her manner became shy and embarrassed, and after an instant of hesitation, she turned back silently to the door. Stop, stop, Nanina, said Brigida in Italian. Don't be afraid of that lady. She is our new forewoman, and she has it in her power to do all sorts of kind things for you. Look up and tell us what you want. You were sixteen last birthday, Nanina, and you behave like a baby of two years old. I only came to know if there was any work for me today, said the girl in a very sweet voice that trembled a little as she tried to face the fashionable French forewoman again. No work, child, that is easy enough for you to do, said Brigida. Are you going to the studio today? Some of the colour that Nanina's cheeks wanted began to steal over them as she answered, Yes. Don't forget my message, darling, and if Master Luca Lomi asks where I live, answer that you are ready to deliver a letter to me, but that you are forbidden to enter into any particulars at first about who I am, or where I live. Why am I forbidden? inquired Nanina innocently. Don't ask questions, baby. Do as you're told. Bring me back a nice note or message tomorrow from the studio, and I will intercede with this lady to get you some work. You are a foolish child to want it, when you might make more money here and at Florence, by sitting to painters and sculptors though what they can see to paint or model in you I never could understand. I like working at home better than going abroad to sit, said Nanina, looking very much abashed as she faltered out the answer, and escaping from the room with a terrified farewell obeisance, which was an eccentric compound of a start, a bow, and a curtsy. That awkward child would be pretty, said Madame Virginie, making rapid progress with the cutting out of her dress. If she knew how to give herself a complexion and had a presentable gown on her back, who is she? The friend who is to get me into Master Luca Lomi's studio, replied Brigida, laughing. Rather a curious ally for me to take up with, isn't she? Where did you meet with her? Here, to be sure. She hangs about this place for any plain work she can get to do and takes it home to the oddest little room in a street near the Campo Santo. I had the curiosity to follow her one day, and knocked at her door soon after she had gone in, as if I was a visitor. She answered my knock in a great flurry and fright, as you may imagine. I made myself agreeable, affected immense interest in her affairs, and so got into her room. Such a place! a mere corner of it curtained off to make a bedroom. One chair, one stool, one saucepan on the fire. Before the hearth, the most grotesquely hideous, unshaven poodle-dog you ever saw. And on the stool, a fair little girl plaiting dinner mats. Such was the household, furniture and all included. "'Where is your father?' I asked. 
he ran away and left us years ago answers my awkward little friend who has just left the room speaking in that simple way of hers with all the composure in the world and your mother dead she went up to the little mat plaiting girl as she gave that answer and began playing with her long flaxen hair your sister i suppose said i what is her name they call me la biondella says the child looking up from her mat la biondella virginie means the fair and why do you let that great shaggy ill-looking brute lie before your fireplace i asked oh cried the little mat platter that is our dear old dog scaramuccia he takes care of the house when nanina is not at home he dances on his hind legs and jumps through a hoop and tumbles down dead when i cry bang scaramuccia followed us home one night years ago and he has lived with us ever since he goes out every day by himself we can't tell where and generally returns licking his chops which makes us afraid that he is a thief but nobody finds him out because he is the cleverest dog that ever lived the child ran on in this way about the great beast by the fireplace till i was obliged to stop her while that simpleton nanina stood by laughing and encouraging her i asked them a few more questions which produced some strange answers they did not seem to know of any relations of theirs in the world the neighbors in the house had helped them after their father ran away until they were old enough to help themselves and they did not seem to think that there was anything in the least wretched or pitiable in their way of living the last thing i heard when i left them that day was la biondella crying bang then a bark a thump on the floor and a scream of laughter if it was not for their dog i should go and see them oftener but the ill-conditioned beast has taken a dislike to me and growls and shows his teeth whenever i come near him the girl looks sickly when she came in here is she always like that no she has altered within the last month i suspect our interesting young nobleman has produced an impression the oftener the girl has sat to him lately the paler and more out of spirits she has become oh she has sat to him has she she is sitting to him now he is doing a bust of some pagan nymph or other and prevailed on nanina to let him copy from her head and face according to her own account the little fool was frightened at first and gave him all the trouble in the world before she would consent and now she has consented don't you think it is likely she may turn out rather a dangerous rival men are such fools and take such fancies into their heads ridiculous a thread paper of a girl like that who has no manner no talk no intelligence who has nothing to recommend her but an awkward babyish prettiness dangerous to me no no if there is danger at all i have to dread it from the sculptor's daughter i don't mind confessing that i am anxious to see madalena lomi but as for nanina she will simply be of use to me all i know already about the studio and the artists in it i know through her she will deliver my message and procure me my introduction and when we have got so far i shall give her an old gown and a shake of the hand and then good-bye to our little innocent well well for your sake i hope you are the wiser of the two in this matter for my part i always distrust innocence wait one moment and i shall have the body and sleeves of this dress ready for the needlewomen there ring the bell and order them up for i have directions to give and you must interpret for me while brigida went to the bell the energetic frenchwoman began planning out the skirt of the new dress she laughed as she measured off yard after yard of the silk what are you laughing about asked brigida opening the door and ringing a handbell in the passage i can't help fancying dear that in spite of her innocent face and her artless ways that your young friend is a hypocrite and i am quite certain love that she is only a simpleton End of section 36
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. After Dark by Wilkie Collins The Professor's Story of the Yellow Mask Part First Chapter Two The studio of the master sculptor, Luca Lomi, was composed of two large rooms, unequally divided by a wooden partition, with an arched doorway cut in the middle of it. While the milliners of the Graffoni establishment were industriously shaping dresses, the sculptors in Luca Lomi's workshop were, in their way, quite as hard at work shaping marble and clay. In the smaller of the two rooms, the young nobleman, only addressed in the studio by his Christian name of Fabio, was busily engaged on his bust, with Nanina sitting before him as a model. His was not one of those traditional Italian faces from which subtlety and suspicion are always supposed to look out darkly on the world at large. Both countenance and expression proclaimed his character frankly and freely to all who saw him. Quick intelligence looked brightly from his eyes, and easy good humor laughed out pleasantly in the rather quaint curve of his lips. For the rest, his face expressed the defects as well as the merits of his character, showing that he wanted resolution and perseverance just as plainly as it showed also that he possessed amiability and intelligence. At the end of the large room, nearest to the street door, Luca Lomi was standing by his life-size statue of Minerva, and was issuing directions, from time to time, to some of his workmen, who were roughly chiseling the drapery of another figure. At the opposite side of the room, nearest to the partition, his brother, Father Rocco, was taking a cast from a statuette of the Madonna, while Madalena Lomi, the sculptor's daughter, released from sitting for Minerva's face, walked about the two rooms and watched what was going on in them. There was a strong family likeness of a certain kind between father, brother, and daughter. All three were tall, handsome, dark-haired, and dark-eyed. Nevertheless, they differed in expression, strikingly as they resembled one another in feature. Magdalena Lomi's face betrayed strong passions, but not an ungenerous nature. Her father, with the same indications of a violent temper, had some sinister lines about his mouth and forehead which suggested anything rather than an open disposition. Father Rocco's countenance, on the other hand, looked like the personification of absolute calmness and invincible moderation, and his manner, which in a very firm way was singularly quiet and deliberate, assisted in carrying out the impression produced by his face. The daughter seemed as if she could fly into a passion at a moment's notice, and forgive also at a moment's notice. The father, appearing to be just as irritable, had something in his face which said, as plainly as if in words, Anger me, and I never pardon. The priest looked as if he never needed to be called on either to ask forgiveness or to grant it, for the double reason that he could irritate nobody else, and that nobody else could irritate him. Rocco, said Luca, looking at the face of his Minerva, which was now finished, this statue of mine will make a sensation. I am glad to hear it, rejoined the priest, dryly. It is a new thing in art, continued Luca, enthusiastically. Other sculptors, with a classical subject like mine, limit themselves to the ideal classical face, and never think of aiming at individual character. Now I do precisely the reverse of that. I get my handsome daughter, Madalena, to sit for Minerva, and I make an exact likeness of her. I may lose in ideal beauty." but I gain an individual character. People may accuse me of disregarding established rules, but my answer is that I make my own rules. My daughter looks like a Minerva, and there she is exactly as she looks. It is certainly a wonderful likeness, said Father Rocco, approaching the statue. It is the girl herself, cried the other, exactly her expression, and exactly her features. Measure Madalena, and measure Minerva, and from forehead to chin you won't find a hair-breadth of difference between them. But how about the bust and arms of the figure, now the face is done, asked the priest, returning, as he spoke, to his own work. I may have the very model I want for them to-morrow. Little Nanina has given me the strangest message. What do you think of a mysterious lady admirer who offers to sit for the bust and arms of my Minerva? Are you going to accept the offer? inquired the priest. I am going to receive her to-morrow and if I really find that she is the same height as Madalena, and has a bust and arms worth modeling, of course I shall accept her offer, for she will be the very sitter I have been looking after for weeks past. Who can she be? That's the mystery I want to find out. Which do you say, Rocco? An enthusiast or an adventuress? 
I do not presume to say, for I have no way of knowing. Ah, there you are with your moderation again. Now I do presume to assert that she must be either one or the other, or she would not have forbidden Nanina to say anything about her in answer to all my first natural inquiries. Where is Madalena? I thought she was here a minute ago. She is in Fabio's room, answered Father Rocco softly. Shall I call her? No, no, returned Luca. He stopped, looked round at the workmen, who were chipping away mechanically at their bit of drapery, then advanced close to the priest with a cunning smile, and continued in a whisper, If Magdalena can only get from Fabio's room here to Fabio's palace over the way, on the Arno, Come, come, Rocco, don't shake your head. If I brought her up to your church door one of these days, as Fabio de Scoli's betrothed, you would be glad enough to take the rest of the business off my hands, and make her Fabio de Scoli's wife. You are a very holy man, Rocco, but you know the difference between the clink of the money bag and the clink of the chisel for all that. I am sorry to find, Luca, returned the priest coldly, that you allow yourself to talk of the most delicate subjects in the coarsest way. This is one of the minor sins of the tongue which is growing on you. When we are alone in the studio, I will endeavor to lead you into speaking of the young man in the room there, and of your daughter, in terms more becoming to you, to me, and to them. Until that time, allow me to go on with my work. Luca shrugged his shoulders, and went back to his statue. Father Rocco, who had been engaged during the last ten minutes in mixing wet plaster to the right consistency for taking a cast, suspended his occupation, and crossing the room to a corner next the partition, removed from it a shovel-glass which stood there. He lifted it away gently, while his brother's back was turned, carried it close to the table at which he had been at work, and then resumed his employment of mixing the plaster. Having at last prepared the composition for use, he laid it over the exposed half of the statuette with a neatness and dexterity which showed him to be a practiced hand at cast-taking. Just as he had covered the necessary extent of surface, Luca turned round from his statue. "'How are you getting on with the cast?' he asked. "'Do you want any help?' "'None, brother. I thank you,' answered the priest. "'Pray, do not disturb either yourself or your workmen on my account.' Luca turned again to the statue, and at the same moment Father Rocco softly moved the shovel-glass toward the open doorway between the two rooms, placing it at such an angle as to make it reflect the figures of the persons in the smaller studio. He did this with significant quickness and precision. It was evidently not the first time he had used the glass for purposes of secret observation. Mechanically stirring the wet plaster round and round for the second casting, the priest looked into the glass, and saw, as in a picture, all that was going forward in the inner room. Magdalena Lomi was standing behind the young nobleman, watching the progress he made with his bust. Occasionally she took the modeling tool out of his hand, and showed him, with her sweetest smile, that she, too, as a sculptor's daughter, understood something of the sculptor's art, and now and then, in the pauses of the conversation, when her interest was especially intense in Fabio's work, she suffered her hand to drop absently on his shoulder, or stooped forward so close to him that her hair mingled for a moment with his. Moving the glass an inch or two so as to bring Nanina well under his eye, Father Rocco found that he could trace each repetition of these little acts of familiarity by the immediate effect which they produced on the girl's face and manner. Whenever Magdalena so much as touched the young nobleman, no matter whether she did so by premeditation or really by accident, Nanina's features contracted, her pale cheeks grew paler, she fidgeted on her chair, and her fingers nervously twisted and untwisted the loose ends of the ribbon fastened round her waist. Jealous, thought Father Rocco. I suspected it weeks ago. He turned away, and gave his whole attention for a few minutes to the mixing of the plaster. When he looked back again at the glass, he was just in time to witness a little accident, which suddenly changed the relative positions of the three persons in the inner room. He saw Magdalena take up a modeling tool which lay on a table near her, and begin to help Fabio in altering the arrangement of the hair in his bust. The young man watched what she was doing earnestly enough for a few moments. Then his attention wandered away to Nanina. She looked at him reproachfully, and he answered by a sign which brought a smile to her face directly. Magdalena surprised her at the instant of the change, and, following the direction of her eyes, easily discovered at whom the smile was directed. She darted a glance of contempt at Nanina, threw down the modeling tool, and turned indignantly to the young sculptor, who was affecting to be hard at work again. "'Signor Fabio,' she said, "'the next time you forget what is due to your rank and yourself, 
Warn me of it, if you please, beforehand, and I will take care to leave the room. While speaking the last words, she passed through the doorway. Father Rocco, bending abstractly over his plaster mixture, heard her continue to herself in a whisper as she went by him. If I have any influence at all with my father, that impudent beggar girl shall be forbidden the studio. Jealousy on the other side, thought the priest. Something must be done at once, or this will end badly. He looked again at the glass, and saw Fabio, after an instant of hesitation, beckon to Nanina to approach him. She left her seat, advanced halfway to his, then stopped. He stepped forward to meet her, and taking her by the hand, whispered earnestly in her ear. When he had done, before dropping her hand, he touched her cheek with his lips, and then helped her on with the little white mantilla which covered her head and shoulders out of doors. The girl trembled violently, and drew the linen close to her face as Fabio walked into the larger studio, and addressing Father Rocco, said, "'I am afraid I am more idle, or more stupid, than ever to-day. I can't get on with the bust at all to my satisfaction, so I have cut short the sitting, and given Nanina a half-holiday.' At the first sound of his voice, Magdalena, who was speaking to her father, stopped, and, with another look of scorn at Danina standing trembling in the doorway, left the room. Luca Lomi called Fabio to him as she went away, and Father Rocco, turning to the statuette, looked to see how the plaster was hardening on it. Seeing them thus engaged, Nanina attempted to escape from the studio without being noticed, but the priest stopped her just as she was hurrying by him. "'My child,' said he, in his gentle, quiet way, are you going home? Nanina's heart beat too fast for her to reply in words. She could only answer by bowing her head. Take this for your little sister, pursued Father Rocco, putting a few silver coins in her hand. I have got some customers for those mats she plates so nicely. You need not bring them to my rooms. I will come and see you this evening, when I am going my rounds among my parishioners, and will take the mats away with me. You are a good girl, Nanina. You have always been a good girl and as long as I am alive, my child, you shall never want a friend and an adviser. Nanina's eyes filled with tears. She drew the mantilla closer than ever round her face as she tried to thank the priest. Father Rocco nodded to her kindly, and laid his hand gently on her head for a moment, then turned round again to his cast. Don't forget my message to the lady who is to sit to me tomorrow, said Luca to Nanina as she passed him on her way out of the studio. After she had gone, Fabio returned to the priest, who was still busy over his cast. "'I hope you will get on better with the bust tomorrow,' said Father Rocco politely. "'I am sure you cannot complain of your model.' "'Complain of her?' cried the young man warmly. "'She has the most beautiful head I ever saw. "'If I were twenty times the sculptor that I am, "'I should despair of being able to do her justice.' He walked into the inner room to look at his bust again, lingered before it for a little while, then turned to retrace his steps to the larger studio. Between him and the doorway stood three chairs. As he went by them, he absently touched the backs of the first two, and passed the third. But just as he was entering the larger room, stopped, as if struck by a sudden recollection, returned hastily, and touched the third chair. Raising his eyes, as he approached the large studio again after doing this, he met the eyes of the priest fixed on him in an unconcealed astonishment. "'Signor Fabio!' exclaimed Father Rocco, with a sarcastic smile. Who would ever have imagined that you were superstitious? My nurse was, returned the young man, reddening and laughing rather uneasily. She taught me some bad habits that I have not got over yet. With those words he nodded and hastily went out. Superstitious, said Father Rocco softly to himself. He smiled again, reflected for a moment, and then, going to the windows, looked into the street. The way to the left led to Fabio's palace, and the way to the right to the Campo Santo, in the neighborhood of which Nanina lived. The priest was just in time to see the young sculptor take the way to the right. After another half-hour had elapsed, the two workmen quitted the studio to go to dinner, and Luca and his brother were left alone. "'We may return now,' said Father Rocco, "'to that conversation which was suspended between us earlier in the day.' I have nothing more to say, rejoined Luca sulkily. Then you can listen to me, brother, with the greater attention, pursued the priest. I objected to the coarseness of your tone in talking of our young pupil and her daughter. I object still more strongly to your insinuation that my desire to see them married, 
provided always that they are sincerely attached to each other, springs from a mercenary motive. You are trying to snare me, Rocco, in a mesh of fine phrases, but I am not to be caught. I know what my own motive is for hoping that Magdalena may get an offer of marriage from this wealthy young gentleman. She will have his money, and we shall all profit by it. That is coarse and mercenary, if you please, but it is the true reason why I want to see Magdalena married to Fabio. You want to see it, too, and for what reason I should like to know, if not for mine. Of what use would wealthy relations be to me? What are people with money? What is money itself, to a man who follows my calling? Money is something to everybody. Is it? When have you found that I have taken any account of it? Give me money enough to buy my daily bread, and to pay for my lodging in my coarse cassock, and though I may want much for the poor, for myself I want no more. Then have you found me mercenary? Do I not help you in this studio, for love of you and of the art, without exacting so much as a journeyman's wages? Have I ever asked you for more than a few crowns to give away on feast days among my parishioners? Money? Money for a man who may be summoned to Rome tomorrow, who may be told to go at half an hour's notice on a foreign mission that may take him to the ends of the earth, and who would be ready to go the moment when he was called on. Money to a man who has no wife, no children, no interests outside the sacred circle of the church? Brother, do you see the dust and dirt and shapeless marble chips lying around your statue there? Cover that floor instead with gold, and though the litter may have changed in color and form, in my eyes it would be litter still. A very noble sentiment, I dare say, Rocco, but I can't echo it. Granted that you care nothing for money, will you explain to me why you are so anxious that Magdalena should marry Fabio? She has had offers from poorer men. You knew of them, but you have never taken the least interest in her accepting or rejecting a proposal before. I hinted the reason to you months ago, when Fabio first entered the studio. It was rather a vague hint, brother. Can't you be plainer today? I think I can. In the first place, let me begin by assuring you that I have no objection to the young man himself. He may be a little capricious and undecided, but he has no incorrigible faults that I have discovered. That is rather a cool way of praising him, Rocco. I should speak of him warmly enough if he were not the representative of an intolerable corruption and a monstrous wrong. Whenever I think of him, I think of an injury which his present existence perpetuates, and if I do speak of him coldly, it is only for that reason. Luca looked away quickly from his brother, and began kicking absently at the marble chips which were scattered over the floor around him. I now remember, he said, what that hint of yours pointed at. I know what you mean. Then you know, answered the priest, that while part of the wealth which Fabio Descoli possesses is honestly and incontestably his own, Part, also, has been inherited by him from the spoilers and robbers of the church. Blame his ancestors for that. Don't blame him. I blame him as long as the spoil is not restored. How do you know that it was spoil, after all? I have examined more carefully than most men the records of the civil wars in Italy, and I know that the ancestors of Fabio de Scoli wrung from the church, in her hour of weakness, property which they dared to claim as their right. I know of titles to lands signed away in those stormy times under the influence of fear or through false representations of which the law takes no account. I call the money thus obtained spoil, and I say that it ought to be restored and shall be restored to the church from which it was taken. And what does Fabio answer to that, brother? I have not spoken to him on the subject. Why not? Because I have, as yet, no influence over him. When he is married, his wife will have influence over him, and she shall speak. Magdalena, I suppose? How do you know that she will speak? Have I not educated her? Does she not understand what her duties are toward the church, in whose bosom she has been reared? Luca hesitated uneasily, and walked away a step or two before he spoke again. Does this spoil, as you call it, amount to a large sum of money? he asked, in an anxious whisper. I may answer that question, Luca, at some future time, said the priest. For the present, let it be enough that you are acquainted with all I undertook to inform you of when we began our conversation. You now know that if I am anxious for this marriage to take place, it is from motives entirely unconnected with self-interest. If all the property which Fabio's ancestors wrongfully obtained from the church were restored to the church tomorrow, not one palo of it would go into my pocket. 
I am a poor priest now, and to the ends of my days shall remain so. You soldiers of the world, brother, fight for your pay. I am a soldier of the church, and I fight for my cause. Saying these words, he returned abruptly to the statuette, and refused to speak or leave his employment again until he had taken the mold off, and had carefully put away the various fragments of which it consisted. This done, he drew a writing desk from the drawer of his working table, and taking out a slip of paper, wrote these lines. Come down to the studio tomorrow. Fabio will be with us, but Nanina will return no more. Without signing what he had written, he sealed it up, and directed it to Dona Magdalena, then took his hat and handed the note to his brother. Oblige me by giving that to my niece, he said. Tell me, Rocco, said Luca, turning the note round and round perplexedly between his thumb and finger. Do you think Madalena will be lucky enough to get married to Fabio? Still coarse in your expressions, brother. Never mind my expressions. Is it likely? Yes, Luca, I think it is likely. With those words, he waved his hand pleasantly to his brother and went out. End of section 37. Recording by Todd. Section 38 of After Dark. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. After Dark by Wilkie Collins. The Professor's Story of the Yellow Mask. Part First, Chapter Three. From the studio, Father Rocco went straight to his own rooms, hard by the church to which he was attached. Opening a cabinet in his study, he took from one of its drawers a handful of small silver money, consulted for a minute or so a slate on which several names and addresses were written, provided himself with a portable inkhorn and some strips of paper and again went out. He directed his steps to the poorest part of the neighborhood, and entering some very wretched houses, was greeted by the inhabitants with great respect and affection. The women, especially, kissed his hands with more reverence than they would have shown to the highest crowned head in Europe. In return, he talked to them as easily and unconstrainedly as if they were his equals, sat down cheerfully on dirty bedsides and rickety benches, and distributed his little gifts of money with the air of a man who was paying debts rather than bestowing charity. Where he encountered cases of illness, he pulled out his inkhorn and slips of paper and wrote simple prescriptions to be made up from the medicine chest of a neighboring convent, which served the same merciful purpose then that is answered by dispensaries in our own days. When he had exhausted his money and had got through his visits, he was escorted out of the poor quarter by a perfect train of enthusiastic followers. The women kissed his hand again, and the men uncovered as he turned, and with a friendly sign bade them all farewell. As soon as he was alone again, he walked toward the Campo Santo, and, passing the house in which Nanina lived, sauntered up and down the street thoughtfully for some minutes. When he at length ascended the steep staircase that led to the room occupied by the sisters, he found the door ajar. Pushing it open gently, he saw La Biandella sitting with her pretty fair profile turned towards him, eating her evening meal of bread and grapes. At the opposite end of the room, Scaramuccia was perched up on his hindquarters in a corner, with his mouth wide open to catch a morsel of bread which he evidently expected the child to throw to him. What the elder sister was doing, the priest had not time to see, for the dog barked the moment he presented himself, and Nanina hastened to the door to ascertain who the intruder might be. All that he could observe was that she was too confused, on catching sight of him, to be able to utter a word. La Biondella was the first to speak. Thank you, Father Rocco, said the child, jumping up with her bread in one hand and her grapes in the other. Thank you for giving me so much money for my dinner mats. There they are, tied up together in one little parcel in the corner. Nanina said she was ashamed to think of your carrying them, and I said I knew where you lived, and I should like to ask you to let me take them home. Do you think you can carry them all the way, my dear? asked the priest. Look, Father Rocco, see if I can't carry them, cried La Biondella, cramming her bread into one of the pockets of her little apron, holding her bunch of grapes by the stalk in her mouth, and hoisting the packet of dinner mats on her head in a moment. See, I am strong enough to carry double, said the child, looking up proudly into the priest's face. Can you trust her to take them home for me? asked Father Rocco, turning to Nanina. I want to speak to you alone, 
and her absence will give me the opportunity. Can you trust her out by herself? Yes, Father Rocco, she often goes out alone. Nanina gave this answer in low, trembling tones, and looked down confusedly on the ground. Go then, my dear, said Father Rocco, patting the child on the shoulder, and come back here to your sister as soon as you have left the mats. La Biondella went out directly in great triumph, with Caramuccia walking by her side, and keeping his muzzle suspiciously close to the pocket in which she had put her bread. Father Rocco closed the door after them, and then, taking the one chair which the room possessed, motioned to Nina to sit by him on the stool. "'Do you believe that I am your friend, my child, and that I have always meant well toward you?' he began. "'The best and kindest of friends,' answered Nanina. "'Then you will hear what I have to say patiently, and you will believe that I am speaking for your good, even if my words should distress you.' Nanina turned away her head. "'Now tell me, should I be wrong, to begin with, if I said that my brother's pupil, the young nobleman whom we call Signor Fabio, had been here to see you today? Nanina started up affrightedly from her stool. Sit down again, my child. I am not going to blame you. I am only going to tell you what you must do for the future. He took her hand. It was cold, and it trembled violently in his. I will not ask what he has been saying to you, continued the priest, for it might distress you to answer and I have, moreover, had means of knowing that your youth and beauty have made a strong impression on him. I will pass over, then, all reference to the words he may have been speaking to you, and I will come at once to what I have now to say in my turn. Nanina, my child, arm yourself with all your courage, and promise me, before we part to-night, that you will see Signor Fabio no more. Nanina turned round suddenly and fixed her eyes on him with an expression of terrified incredulity. "'No more?' "'You are very young and very innocent,' said Father Rocco. "'But surely you must have thought before now of the difference between Signor Fabio and you. Surely you must have often remembered that you are low down among the ranks of the poor, and that he is high up among the rich and the nobly born.' Nanina's hands dropped on the priest's knees. She bent her head down on them, and began to weep bitterly. "'Surely you must have thought of that,' reiterated Father Rocco. "'Oh, I have often, often thought of it,' murmured the girl. "'I have mourned over it, and cried about it in secret for many nights past. He said I looked pale and ill and out of spirits today, and I told him it was with thinking of that.' "'And what did he say in return?' There was no answer. Father Rocco looked down. Nanina raised her head directly from his knees, and tried to turn it away again. He took her hand and stopped her. Come, he said, speak frankly to me. Say what you ought to say to your father and your friend. What was his answer, my child, when you reminded him of the difference between you? He said I was born to be a lady, faltered the girl, still struggling to turn her face away and that I might make myself one if I would learn and be patient. He said that if he had all the noble ladies in Pisa to choose from on one side, and only little Nanina on the other, he would hold out his hand to me, and tell them, This shall be my wife. He said love knew no difference of rank, and that if he was a nobleman and rich, it was all the more reason why he should please himself. He was so kind that I thought my heart would burst while he was speaking and my little sister liked him so that she got upon his knee and kissed him. Even our dog, who growls at other strangers, stole to his side and licked his hand. Oh, Father Rocco! Father Rocco! The tears burst out afresh, and the lovely head dropped once more, wearily, on the priest's knee. Father Rocco smiled to himself, and waited to speak again until she was calmer. Supposing he resumed, after some minutes of silence. Supposing Signor Fabio really meant all he said to you. Nanina started up, and confronted the priest boldly for the first time since he had entered the room. Supposing! she exclaimed, her cheeks beginning to redden, and her dark blue eyes flashing suddenly through her tears. Supposing! Father Rocco, Fabio would never deceive me. I would die here at your feet, rather than doubt the least word he said to me. 
the priest signed to her quietly to return to the stool. I never suspected the child had so much spirit in her, he thought to himself. I would die, repeated Nanina, in a voice that began to falter now. I would die rather than doubt him. I will not ask you to doubt him, said Father Rocco gently, and I will believe in him myself as firmly as you do. Let us suppose, my child, that you have learned patiently all the many things of which you are now ignorant, and which it is necessary for a lady to know. Let us suppose that Signor Fabio has really violated all the laws that govern people in his high station, and has taken you to him publicly as his wife. You would be happy then, Nanina. But would he? He has no father or mother to control him, it is true. But he has friends, many friends and intimates of his own rank, proud, heartless people, who know nothing of your worth and goodness, who, hearing of your low birth, will look on you, and on your husband too, my child, with contempt. He has not your patience and fortitude. Think how bitter it would be for him to bear that contempt, to see you shunned by proud woman, and carelessly pitied or patronized by insolent men. Yet all this, and more, he would have to endure, or else to quit the world he has lived in from his boyhood, the world he was born to live in. You love him, I know. Nanina's tears burst out afresh. Oh, how dearly, how dearly, she murmured. Yes, you love him dearly, continued the priest. But would all your love compensate him for everything else that he must lose? It might, at first. But there would come a time when the world would assert its influence over him again, when he would feel a want which you could not supply, a weariness which you could not solace. Think of his life then, and of yours. Think of the first day when the first secret doubt whether he had done rightly in marrying you would steal into his mind. We are not masters of all our impulses. The lightest spirits have their moments of irresistible depression. The bravest hearts are not always superior to doubt. My child, my child, the world is strong. The pride of rank is rooted deep, and the human will is frail at best. Be warned. For your own sake and for Fabio's, be warned in time. Nanina stretched out her hands towards the priest in despair. Oh, Father Rocco, Father Rocco, she cried. Why did you not tell me this before? Because, my child, I only knew of the necessity for telling you today. But it is not too late. It is never too late to do a good action. You love Fabio, Nanina? Will you prove that love by making a great sacrifice for his good? I would die for his good. Will you nobly cure him of a passion which will be his ruin, if not yours, by leaving Pisa to-morrow? Leave Pisa? exclaimed Nanina. Her face grew deadly pale. She rose and moved back a step or two from the priest. Listen to me, pursued Father Rocco. I have heard you complain that you could not get regular employment at needlework. You shall have that employment if you will go with me, you and your little sister too, of course, to Florence tomorrow. I promised Fabio to go to the studio, began Nanina affrightedly. I promised to go at ten o'clock. How can I? She stopped suddenly, as if her breath were failing her. I myself will take you and your sister to Florence, said Father Rocco, without noticing the interruption. I will place you under the care of a lady who will be as kind as a mother to you both. I will answer for your getting such work to do as will enable you to keep yourself honestly and independently, and I will undertake, if you do not like your life at Florence, to bring you back to Pisa after a lapse of three months only. Three months, Ninina. It is not a long exile. Fabio! Fabio! cried the girl, sinking again on the seat and hiding her face. It is for his good, said Father Rocco calmly. For Fabio's good, remember? What would he think of me if I went away? Oh, if I had but learned to write, if I could only write Fabio a letter. Am I not to be depended on to explain to him all that he ought to know? How can I go away from him? Oh, Father Rocco, how can you ask me to go away from him? I will ask you to do nothing hastily. I will leave you till tomorrow morning to decide. At nine o'clock I shall be in the street, 
and I will not even so much as enter this house, unless I know beforehand that you have resolved to follow my advice. Give me a sign from your window. If I see you wave your white mantilla out of it, I shall know that you have taken the noble resolution to save Fabio and to save yourself. I will say no more, my child, for, unless I am grievously mistaken in you, I have already said enough. He went out, leaving her still weeping bitterly. Not far from the house, he met La Biondella and the dog on their way back. The little girl stopped to report to him the safe delivery of her dinner mats, but he passed on quickly with a nod and a smile. His interview with Nanina had left some influence behind it, which unfitted him just then for the occupation of talking to a child. Nearly half an hour before nine o'clock on the following morning, Father Rocco set forth for the street in which Nanina lived. On his way thither he overtook a dog walking lazily a few paces ahead in the roadway, and saw, at the same time, an elegantly dressed lady advancing toward him. The dog stopped suspiciously as she approached, and growled and showed his teeth when she passed him. The lady, on her side, uttered an exclamation of disgust, but did not seem to be either astonished or frightened by the animal's threatening attitude. Father Rocco looked after her with some curiosity as she walked by him. She was a handsome woman, and he admired her courage. "'I know that growling brute well enough,' he said to himself. "'But who can that lady be?' The dog was Scaramuccia, returning from one of his marauding expeditions. The lady was Brigida, on her way to Luca Lomi's studio. Some minutes before nine o'clock, the priest took his post in the street, opposite Nanina's window. It was open, but neither she nor her little sister appeared at it. He looked up anxiously as the church clock struck the hour, but there was no sign for a minute or so after they were all silent. "'Is she hesitating still?' said Father Rocco to himself. Just as the words passed his lips, the white mantilla was waved out of the window. End of section 38 Recording by Todd Section 39 of After Dark. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. After Dark by Wilkie Collins. The Professor's Story of the Yellow Mask. Part Second. Chapter One. Even the master stroke of replacing the treacherous Italian forewoman by a French dressmaker engaged direct from Paris, did not at first avail to elevate the great Griffoni establishment above the reach of minor calamities. Mademoiselle Virginie had not occupied her new situation at Pisa quite a week before she fell ill. All sorts of reports were circulated as to the cause of this illness, and the Demoiselle Griffoni even went so far as to suggest the health of the new forewoman had fallen a sacrifice to some nefarious practices of the chemical sort, on the part of her rival in the trade. But, however the misfortune had been produced, it was a fact that Mademoiselle Virginie was certainly very ill, and another fact that the doctor insisted on her being sent to the baths at Lucca as soon as she could be moved from her bed. Fortunately for the Demoiselle Griffoni, the Frenchwoman had succeeded in producing three specimens of her art before her health broke down. They comprised the evening dress of yellow brocaded silk, to which she had devoted herself on the morning when she first assumed her duties at Pisa, a black cloak and hood of an entirely new shape, and an irresistibly fascinating dressing gown, said to have been first brought into fashion by the princesses of the royal blood of France. These articles of costume, on being exhibited in the showroom, electrified the ladies of Pisa, and orders from all sides flowed in immediately on the Graffoni establishment. They were, of course, easily executed by the inferior workwomen, from the specimen dresses of the French dressmaker, so that the illness of Mademoiselle Virginie, though it might cause her mistress some temporary inconvenience, was, after all, productive of no absolute loss. Two months at the Baths of Lucca restored the new forewoman to health. She returned to Pisa and resumed her place in the private workroom. Once re-established there, she discovered that an important change had taken place during her absence. Her friend and assistant, Brigida, had resigned her situation. All inquiries made of the Demoiselle Griffoni only elicited one answer. The missing workwoman had abruptly left her place at five minutes' warning, 
and had departed without confiding to any one what she thought of doing, or whither she intended to turn her steps. Months elapsed. The new year came, but no explanatory letter arrived from Brigida. The spring season passed off, with all its accompaniments of dressmaking and dress-buying, but still there was no news of her. The first anniversary of Mademoiselle Virginie's engagement with the Demoiselle Graffoni came round, and then, at last, a note arrived, stating that Brigida had returned to Pisa, and that if the French forewoman would send an answer, mentioning where her private lodgings were, she would visit her old friend that evening after business hours. The information was gladly enough given, and punctually to the appointed time, Brigida arrived at Mademoiselle Virginie's little sitting-room. Advancing with her usual indolent stateliness of gait, the Italian asked after her friend's health as coolly, and sat down in the nearest chair as carelessly, as if they had not been separated for more than a few days. Mademoiselle Virginie laughed in her liveliest manner, and raised her mobile French eyebrows in sprightly astonishment. "'Well, Brigida,' she exclaimed, "'they certainly did you no injustice when they nicknamed you Care for Nothing in old Griffoni's workroom. Where have you been? Why have you never written to me?' I had nothing particular to write about, and besides, I always intended to come back to Pisa and see you, answered Brigida, leaning back luxuriously in her chair. But where have you been for nearly a whole year past? In Italy? No, at Paris. You know I can sing, not very well, but I have a voice, and most French women, excuse the impertinence, have none. I met with a friend and got introduced to a manager and I have been singing at the theatre. Not the great parts, only the second. Your amiable countrywoman could not screech me down on the stage, but they intrigued against me successfully behind the scenes. In short, I quarrelled with our principal lady, quarrelled with the manager, quarrelled with my friend, and here I am back at Pisa, with a little money saved in my pocket, and no great notion what I am to do next. Back at Pisa? Why did you leave it? Brigida's eyes began to lose their indolent expression. She sat up suddenly in her chair, and set one of her hands heavily on a little table by her side. Why? she repeated. Because when I find the game going against me, I prefer giving it up at once to waiting to be beaten. Ah, you refer to that last year's project of yours for making your fortune among the sculptors. I should like to hear how it was you failed with the wealthy young amateur. Remember that I fell ill before you had any news to give me. Your absence when I returned from Luca, and almost immediately afterwards the marriage of your intended conquest to the sculptor's daughter, proved to me, of course, that you must have failed. But I never heard how. I know nothing at this moment but the bare fact that Madalena Lomi won the prize. Tell me first, do she and her husband live together happily? There are no stories of their disagreeing. She has dresses, horses, carriages, a negro page, the smallest lapdog in Italy. In short, all the luxuries that a woman can want, and a child, by the by, into the bargain. A child? Yes, a child, born little more than a week ago. Not a boy, I hope. No, a girl. I am glad of that. Those rich people always want the firstborn to be an heir. They will both be disappointed. I am glad of that. Mercy on us, Brigida, how fierce you look. Do I? It's likely enough. I hate Fabio de Scoli and Magdalena Lomi, singly as man and woman, doubly as man and wife. Stop. I'll tell you what you want to know directly. Only answer me another question or two first. Have you heard anything about her health? Why should I hear? Dressmakers can't inquire at the doors of the nobility. True. Now one last question. That little simpleton, Nanina. I have never seen or heard anything of her. She can't be at Pisa, or she would have called at our place of work. Ah, I need not have asked about her if I had thought a moment beforehand. Father Rocco would be sure to keep her out of Fabio's sight, for his niece's sake. What? He really loved that thread paper of a girl, as you called her? Better than fifty such wives as he has got now. I was in the studio the morning he was told of her departure from Pisa. A letter was privately given to him, telling him that the girl had left the place out of a feeling of honor, 
and had hidden herself beyond the possibility of discovery to prevent him from compromising himself with all his friends by marrying her. Naturally enough, he would not believe that this was her own doing, and, naturally enough also, when Father Rocco was sent for, and was not to be found, he suspected the priest of being at the bottom of the business. I never saw a man in such a fury of despair and rage before. He swore that he would have all Italy searched for the girl, and that he would be the death of the priest, and that he would never enter Luca Lomi's studio again. And, as to this last particular, of course, being a man, he failed to keep his word. Of course. At that first visit of mine to the studio, I discovered two things. The first, as I said, that Fabio was really in love with the girl. The second, that Madalena Lomi was really in love with him. You may suppose I looked at her attentively while the disturbance was going on, and while nobody's notice was directed on me. All women are vain, I know, but vanity never blinded my eyes. I saw directly that I had but one superiority over her, my figure. She was my height, but not well made. She had hair as dark and as glossy as mine, eyes as bright and as black as mine, and the rest of her face better than mine. My nose is coarse, my lips are too thick, and my upper lip overhangs my under too far. She had none of those personal faults, and, as for capacity, she managed the young fool in his passion as well as I could have managed him in her place. How? Oh. She stood silent, with downcast eyes and a distressed look, all the time he was raving up and down the studio. She must have hated the girl, and been rejoiced at her disappearance, but she never showed it. You would be an awkward rival, I thought to myself, even to a handsomer woman than I. However, I determined not to despair too soon, and made up my mind to follow my plan, just as if the accident of the girl's disappearance had never occurred. I smoothed down the master sculptor easily enough, flattering him about his reputation, assuring him that the works of Luca Lomi had been the objects of my adoration since childhood, telling him that I had heard of his difficulty in finding a model to complete his Minerva form, and offering myself, if he thought me worthy, for the honor, laying great stress on that word, for the honor of sitting to him. I don't know whether he was altogether deceived by what I told him, but he was sharp enough to see that I really could be of use, and he accepted my offer with a profusion of compliments. We parted, having arranged that I was to give him a first sitting in a week's time. Why put it off so long? To allow our young gentleman time to cool down and return to the studio, to be sure. What was the use of my being there while he was away? Yes, yes, I forgot. And how long was it before he came back? I had allowed him more time than enough. When I had given my first sitting, I saw him in the studio, and heard it was his second visit there since the day of the girl's disappearance. Those very violent men are always changeable and irresolute. Has he made no attempt, then, to discover Nanina? Oh, yes. He had searched for her himself, and had set others searching for her, but to no purpose. Four days of perpetual disappointment had been enough to bring him to his senses. Luca Lomi had written him a peacemaking letter, asking what harm he or his daughter had done, even supposing Father Rocco was to blame. Madalena Lomi had met him in the street, and had looked resignedly away from him, as if she expected him to pass her. In short, they had awakened his sense of justice, and his good nature. You see, I can impartially give him his due. And they had got him back. He was silent and sentimental enough at first, and shockingly sulky and savage with the priest. I wonder Father Rocco ventured within his reach. Father Rocco was not a man to be daunted or defeated by anybody, I can tell you. The same day on which Fabio came back to the studio, he returned to it, beyond boldly declaring that he thought Nanina had done quite right, and had acted like a good and virtuous girl, he would say nothing about her or her disappearance. It was quite useless to ask him questions. He denied that anyone had a right to put them. Threatening, entreating, flattering, all modes of appeal were thrown away on him. Ah, my dear, depend upon it, the cleverest and politest man in Pisa, the most dangerous to an enemy, and the most delightful to a friend, is Father Rocco. The rest of them, when I began to play my cards a little too openly, behaved with brutal rudeness to me. Father Rocco, from first to last, treated me like a lady. Sincere or not, 
I don't care. He treated me like a lady when the others treated me like... There, there! Don't get hot about it now. Tell me instead how you made your first approaches to the young gentleman whom you talk of so contemptuously as Fabio. As it turned out, in the worst possible way. First, of course, I made sure of interesting him in me by telling him that I had known Nanina. So far it was all well enough. My next object was to persuade him that she could never have gone away if she had truly loved him alone, and that he must have had some fortunate rival in her own rank of life to whom she had sacrificed him, after gratifying her vanity for a time by bringing a young nobleman to her feet. I had, as you will easily imagine, difficulty enough in making him take this view of Nanina's flight. His pride and his love for the girl were both concerned in refusing to admit the truth of my suggestion. At last I succeeded. I brought him to that state of ruffled vanity and fretful self-assertion in which it is easiest to work on a man's feelings, in which a man's own wounded pride makes the best pitfall to catch him in. I brought him, I say, to that state, and then she stepped in and profited by what I had done. Is it wonderful now that I rejoice in her disappointments, that I should be glad to hear any ill thing of her that any one could tell me? But how did she first get the advantage of you? If I had found out, she would never have succeeded where I failed. All I know is that she had more opportunities of seeing him than I, and that she used them cunningly enough even to deceive me. While I thought I was gaining ground with Fabio, I was actually losing it. My first suspicions were excited by a change in Luca Lomi's conduct towards me. He grew cold, neglectful, at last absolutely rude. I was resolved not to see this but accident soon obliged me to open my eyes. One morning I heard Fabio and Madalena talking of me when they imagined I had left the studio. I can't repeat their words, especially here. The blood flies into my head, and the cold catches me at the heart when I only think of them. It will be enough if I tell you that he laughed at me, and that she... Hush, not so loud. There are other people lodging in the house. Never mind about telling me what you heard. It only irritates you to no purpose. I can guess that they had discovered, through her, remember, all through her. Yes, yes, I understand. They had discovered a great deal more than you ever intended them to know, and all through her. But for the priest, Virginie, I should have been openly insulted and driven from their doors. He had insisted on their behaving with decent civility toward me. They said that he was afraid of me, and laughed at the notion of his trying to make them afraid, too. That was the last thing I heard. The fury I was in and the necessity of keeping it down almost suffocated me. I turned round to leave the place forever, when, who should I see, standing close behind me, but Father Rocco. He must have discovered in my face that I knew all, but he took no notice of it. He only asked, in his usual quiet, polite way, if I was looking for anything I had lost, and if he could help me. I managed to thank him and to get to the door, he opened it for me respectfully, and bowed. He treated me like a lady to the last. It was evening when I left the studio in that way. The next morning I threw up my situation and turned my back on Pisa. Now you know everything. Did you hear of the marriage, or did you only assume from what you knew that it would take place? I heard of it about six months ago. A man came to sing in the chorus at our theatre, who had been employed some time before at the grand concert given on the occasion of the marriage. But let us drop the subject now. I am in a fever already with talking of it. You are in a bad situation here, my dear. I declare, your room is almost stifling. Shall I open the other window? No. Let us go out and get a breath of air by the riverside. Come, take your hood and fan. It is getting dark. Nobody will see us and we can come back here, if you like, in half an hour. Mademoiselle Virginie acceded to her friend's wish rather reluctantly. They walked toward the river. The sun was down, and the sudden night of Italy was gathering fast. Although Brigitte did not say another word on the subject of Fabio or his wife, she led the way to the bank of the Arno on which the young nobleman's palace stood. Just as they got near the great door of entrance, a sedan chair, approaching in the opposite direction, was set down before it, and a footman, after a moment's conference with a lady inside the chair, advanced to the porter's lodge in the courtyard. Leaving her friend to go on, Brigida slipped in after the servant by the open wicket, and concealed herself in the shadow cast by the great closed gates. 
la marchesa milani to inquire how the countess de scoli and the infant are this evening said the footman my mistress has not changed at all for the better since the morning answered the porter the child is doing quite well the footman went back to the sedan chair then returned to the porter's lodge the marchesa desires me to ask if fresh medical advice has been sent for he said another doctor has arrived from florence to-day replied the porter mademoiselle virginie missing her friend suddenly turned back toward the palace to look after her and was rather surprised to see brigida slip out of the wicket gate there were two oil lamps burning on pillars outside the doorway and their light glancing on the italian's face as she passed under them showed that she was smiling End of section thirty nine recording by Todd Section forty of After Dark This is a Librivox recording. All Librivox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit Librivox dot org. After Dark by Wilkie Collins the professor's story of the yellow mask part second chapter two while the marchesa milani was making inquiries at the gate of the palace fabio was sitting alone in the apartment which his wife usually occupied when she was in health it was her favourite room and had been prettily decorated by her own desire with hangings in yellow satin and furniture of the same colour Fabio was now waiting in it to hear the report of the doctors after their evening visit. Although Madalena Lomi had not been his first love, and although he had married her under circumstances which are generally and rightly considered to afford few chances of lasting happiness in wedded life, still they had lived together through the one year of their union tranquilly, if not fondly. She had moulded herself wisely to his peculiar humours, had made the most of his easy disposition, and when her quick temper had got the better of her, had seldom hesitated in her cooler moments to acknowledge that she had been wrong. She had been extravagant, it is true, and had irritated him by fits of unreasonable jealousy, but these were faults not to be thought of now. He could only remember that she was the mother of his child, and that she lay ill but two rooms away from him, dangerously ill, as the doctors had unwillingly confessed on that very day. The darkness was closing in upon him, and he took up the handbell to ring for lights. When the servant entered, there was genuine sorrow in his face, genuine anxiety in his voice as he inquired for news from the sick-room. The man only answered that his mistress was still asleep, and then withdrew, after first leaving a sealed letter on the table by his master's side. Fabio summoned him back into the room, and asked when the letter had arrived. He replied that it had been delivered at the palace two days since, and that he had observed it lying unopened on a desk in his master's study. Left alone again, Fabio remembered that the letter had arrived at a time when the first dangerous symptoms of his wife's illness had declared themselves, and that he had thrown it aside after observing the address to be in a handwriting unknown to him. In his present state of suspense, any occupation was better than sitting idle, so he took up the letter with a sigh, broke the seal, and turned inquiringly to the name signed at the end. It was Nanina. He started and changed colour. A letter from her, he whispered to himself. Why does it come at such a time as this? His face grew paler, and the letter trembled in his fingers. Those superstitious feelings which he had ascribed to the nursery influences of his childhood, when Father Rocco charged him with them in the studio, seemed to be overcoming him now. He hesitated, and listened anxiously in the direction of his wife's room, before reading the letter. 
Was its arrival ominous of good or evil? That was the thought in his heart as he drew the lamp near to him and looked at the first lines. "'Am I wrong in writing to you?' the letter began abruptly. "'If I am, you have but to throw this little leaf of paper into the fire, and to think no more of it after it is burned up and gone. I can never reproach you for treating my letter in that way, for we are never likely to meet again. Why did I go away? Only to save you from the consequences of marrying a poor girl who was not fit to become your wife. It almost broke my heart to leave you, for I had nothing to keep up my courage but the remembrance that I was going away for your sake. I had to think of that morning and night, to think of it always, or I am afraid I should have faltered in my resolution and have gone back to Pisa. I longed so much at first to see you once more, only to tell you that Nanina was not heartless and ungrateful, and that you might pity her and think kindly of her, though you might love her no longer. Only to tell you that if I had been a lady, I might have told it to you in a letter. But I had never learned to write, and I could not prevail on myself to get others to take the pen for me. All I could do was to learn secretly how to write with my own hand. It was long, long work, but the uppermost thought in my heart was always the thought of justifying myself to you, and that made me patient and persevering. I learned at last to write, so as not to be ashamed of myself or to make you ashamed of me. I began a letter, my first letter to you, but I heard of your marriage before it was done, and then I had to tear the paper up and put the pen down again. I had no right to come between you and your wife, even with so little a thing as a letter. I had no right to do anything but hope and pray for your happiness. Are you happy? I am sure you ought to be, for how can your wife help loving you? It is very hard for me to explain why I have ventured on writing now, and yet I can't think that I am doing wrong. I heard a few days ago, for I have a friend at Pisa who keeps me informed, by my own desire, of all the pleasant changes in your life. I heard of your child being born, and I thought myself after that justified at last in writing to you. No letter from me, at such a time as this, can rob your child's mother of so much as a thought of yours that is due to her. Thus at least it seems to me. I wish so well to your child that I cannot surely be doing wrong in writing these lines. I have said already what I wanted to say, what I have been longing to say for a whole year past. I have told you why I left Pisa, and have perhaps persuaded you that I have gone through some suffering and borne some heartaches for your sake. Have I more to write? Only a word or two, to tell you that I am earning my bread as I always wish to earn it, quietly at home. At least, at what I must call home now. I am living with reputable people, and I want for nothing. La Biondella has grown very much. She would hardly be obliged to get on your knee to kiss you now, and she can plait her dinner mats faster and more neatly than ever. Our old dog is with us, and has learned two new tricks. But you can't be expected to remember him, although you were the only stranger I ever saw him take kindly to at first. It is time I finished. If you have read this letter through to the end, I am sure you will excuse me if I have written it badly. There is no date to it, because I feel that it is safest and best for both of us that you should know nothing of where I am living. I bless and pray for you, and bid you affectionately farewell. If you can think of me as a sister, think of me sometime still. Fabio sighed bitterly while he read the letter. Why, he whispered to himself, why does it come at such a time as this, 
when I cannot dare not think of her. As he slowly folded the letter up, the tears came into his eyes, and he half raised the paper to his lips. At the same moment someone knocked at the door of the room. He started, and felt himself changing colour guiltily, as one of his servants entered. "'My mistress is awake,' the man said, with a very grave face and a very constrained manner, "'and the gentlemen in attendance desire me to say—' He was interrupted before he could give his message by one of the medical men who had followed him into the room. "'I wish I had better news to communicate,' began the doctor gently. "'She is worse, then,' said Fabio sinking back into the chair from which he had risen the moment before. "'She has awakened weaker instead of stronger after her sleep,' returned the doctor evasively. "'I never like to give up all hope till the very last. "'But it is cruel not to be candid with him,' interposed another voice, the voice of the doctor from Florence, who had just entered the room. "'Strengthen yourself to bear the worst.' he continued, addressing himself to Fabio. "'She is dying. Can you compose yourself enough to go to her bedside?' Pale and speechless, Fabio rose from his chair, and made a sign in the affirmative. He trembled so that the doctor who had first spoken was obliged to lead him out of the room. "'Your mistress has some near relations in Pisa, has she not?' said the doctor from Florence appealing to the servant who waited near him. "'Her father, sir, Signor Luca Lomi, and her uncle, Father Rocco,' answered the man. "'They were here all through the day, until my mistress fell asleep. "'Do you know where to find them now?' "'Signor Luca told me he should be at his studio, and Father Rocco said I might find him at his lodgings. "'Send for them both directly.' "'Stay. Who is your mistress's confessor? He ought to be summoned without loss of time. "'My mistress's confessor is Father Rocco, sir. "'Very well. Send or go yourself at once. Even minutes may be of importance now.' Saying this, the doctor turned away, and sat down to wait for any last demands on his services in the chair which Fabio had just left. End of section 40